I'm Holly Constant. And I'm Maddie Hockaday. We really love Parks and Rec, and we really love behind-the-scenes details. So we're researching everything from DVD extras like deleted scenes and commentaries. Plus, interviewing cast and crew who actually worked on the show. We also bring on guests and friends to geek out about everything Parks. So join us, you tropical fish. This is literally the best Parks and Rec rewatch podcast. We're your park pals. There's a park and some pals and there's also therapy too. Okay, hi, we're starting. This is crazy. What am I even doing here? And also, why am I like nervous? Like, how did I used to get up on stage in front of people? That seems crazy. Um, why? <laughs> why? Why are we doing this again? Anyway, okay, so I'm going to get right into it. Also, a couple of housekeeping things. You're going to hear my regular voice, um, but I'm recording this on, if you care about the audio, okay, whatever. If you're wondering, like, why doesn't it sound like, better or like good or something it's because I'm using the mic to record for the podcast that will come out in a couple weeks or whatever and regular audio for you um okay side note couple of housekeeping moments you may or may not have noticed that I am wearing a wonderful shirt called Park Pals Podcast that is what the shirt is called and it, there's multiple do you like how I motioned <laughs> to that area um there are also uh, some really cool uh, merch things coming out I'm waiting for the final products so I'm really hoping that that will happen soon um and again I don't even know why um I'm nervous I'm just thinking about that because this is the first time and you guys are going to take some time to like get used to me going live potentially so I hope that you guys enjoy it um oh my god Ren hi hello <laughs> I get, this is the first time I'm doing this. This is going to be like two hours on here. Okay. Anyways, so, I, okay. I'm drinking my wine um, out of a Park Pals mug. I've got my Park Pals shirt on and there are stickers that will be out. I'll post all that stuff. Um, okay. So, I'm just going to run this like a regular podcast. First of all, rate and review. Bonus podcasts are up. If you want to do the $3 um, a month, Uh, Catherine is amazing. And Catherine's probably not watching this at this moment. Actually, I know that she's not, but she might watch it later. Has been awesome and giving me really great suggestions. So please, please, please... um, Tell me what you want to talk about, and we'll talk about it, and we'll start a whole other forum. So that's bonus pods. Okay, I have a bit of a recap um, from the last episode. Now, I do want to mention that if you are following along on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever, you might... Um, notice that this episode is not consecutive. So uh, the last episode I think that was released was the comeback kid with Crystal Dockery, which is the one on the ice skating rink. Oh my God. (laughs) Amazing. Um, But this one that I'm going to be doing is lucky. The one with Sean Hayes, the one where Leslie's like, we need to be lucky to win a campaign kind of thing. Um, So I'm just going to go that that's the order that we're in of recording, not of releasing. So I just hope that you enjoy and have a fun ride with us anyway. So from the last episode that we did, Chris Regan, who played one of the political pundits in the last episode on PURD, sent in an amazing uh, voice memo of how he got his job on Parks and Rec, how he worked through um, like getting called and being on set and all these things. So I'm going to go ahead and play that. And mind you, it is like five ish minutes long so if you need to like put it down and go do something then um you know just have it on the background but it was so wonderful and i'm excited for you guys to hear it so i'm just gonna so how did i get my job on parks uh <laughs> i think like a lot of my acting jobs i got it kind of by accident um i'm a comedy writer by trade mostly and uh many years ago i worked with a writer by the name of dan gore on the daily show and uh he left around 2001 i stayed until around 2000 six or so, but we stayed in touch over the years. And uh, subsequently I had moved to Los Angeles. And at one point, Dan, um, well, Dan went on to write for Parks, obviously for many years, but at one point he was doing a pilot for a network. It was a multi-cam pilot. I believe it was about a family of doctors, which uh, I believe Dan comes from, but he called me into work on his pilot for a day or two. And uh, that's something that that's kind of common when you're doing a pilot. You bring a bunch of comedians, comedy writers in, and they pitch jokes and see where they can punch up and this, that, and the other thing. But a few weeks later, I got a call from Dan on a Sunday, and he said, uh, hey, you know, it's Dan. Hey, uh, tomorrow, can you help me out um, with my Parks episode? And I said, oh, yeah, sure, sure. And he's like, oh, okay, okay. Uh, wardrobe will give you a call. And then he hung up the phone. And I'm like, uh, Wardrobe? 
So I got a call from Wardrobe later, and apparently I had a part in an episode that Dan wrote and uh, that he was going to direct. I believe it was the first one he was going to direct. So uh, that's ba- <laughs> there wasn't any kind of audition. Um, the fact that I was shooting the following day or the following Tuesday or something makes me think that the real actor dropped out. But um, whatever happened to that guy, uh, it turned out it was very advantageous for me. And, uh, yeah, that's basically how I got cast. So what was my day on the set like? Um, like any day I'm on a set, it was kind of nerve-wracking. Uh, but it was a pretty long day. You know, um, started with wardrobe, and they you know, uh, fitted me for this particular costume, which was kind of a straight-down-the-middle sort of uh, costume. I was uh, – they took my measurements and everything, tried it on, then they took it away and fit it uh, for me. And then I had to go into the hair and makeup chair, and uh, they did uh, – the, the woman who was doing my hair styled it in such a way that I thought it was pretty – you know, I thought it looked pretty good. Uh, but then she told me halfway through that the look they were trying to get with Parks and Rec, particularly for people on the news, was a, sort of an outdated look. They said they were kind of going for sort of a 1990s feel. But whatever, I, I thought I looked pretty good. And um, then I was just kind of walked back to my uh, camper, um, my dressing room, which was pretty nice and spacious. And on the way there, I, I got to meet Catherine Hahn, who was also shooting that episode that day. She was very, very nice. I got to meet Rob Lowe, who is um, just a beautiful man. I have to say, he's, he's one of those guys who looks like he has a light bulb inside him that's on. He just sort of glows from within. He was very kind and very friendly. And uh, then, you know, I went back to my camper. Um, they then dropped off my wardrobe. I put it on. And then I proceeded for several hours because, um, you know, these things happen when you're shooting. There are delays and delays and delays. And for seven hours, I just worked on delivering my lines every which way I could possibly do it. Um, occasionally, I was sort of doing the kind of a stuffy Fox News character. Sometimes I was doing it as myself. Sometimes I was trying to do it as what I imagine a local guy on the news would sound like. And then after several hours, uh, someone finally knocked on my dressing room door, and I left, and I went to the very, very big sound stage, and there was the news set. And uh, uh, Perd Hapley was already there, and the actress I was acting opposite, uh, she was there as well. And I sat down, and you know, I spoke to Dan very briefly, and I was I just asked him very quickly, like, so you think in Fox News, local news anchor, me? It's like, uh, uh, j- just do it like you. And then he ran and went behind the camera, and we did a take or two. And Dan came up and uh, said something or other to the other actors I was working with. And then he just turned to me and said, speed it up. And then he went off behind the camera again. So I sped it up. And, uh, yeah, we did a couple of things. We shot that whole sequence for, I don't know, we spent maybe 45 minutes on it or so. And uh, I was happy because it was a cold open, which meant that um, it probably wouldn't get cut. And ideally, I probably wouldn't get replaced. But um, uh, we, we did the shoot, and I felt really, really good. And I was excited to be a part of um, such a good show and such a well-loved show. And then I was walking off, and I bumped into a guy who was uh, Dan's manager. Um, I, uh, I imagine they're, they're still working together, this guy named Dave, who I've known for many years. And uh, he mentioned to me that if I weren't able to make it, he would, he would have had to play my part. <laughs> so um, uh, needless to say, it was a very unorthodox style of casting a show, but I was, um, I was very happy to do it. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, to this day, I still have people in my life who I know who are just like, hey, were you? Were you on Parks and Rack? Like, yep, yep, I was, I was on it one time. All in all, it's, yeah, obviously it was a very positive experience. And uh, interesting because I had interviewed about seven or eight months beforehand with the showrunner of the show, Mike Schur, as for a position as a writer on the program. And um, honestly, I had not followed the show, really, after its first season. And in the week or so leading up to my interview, I, I just binged it around the clock. And I, I, I saw, like, maybe the rest of the show up until that point. I don't remember what season campaign shakeup was in. But, uh, yeah, I really I, – I just crammed on Parks and Rec and, you know, it turned out to be a great show. I was very disappointed that I didn't get a job on it. 
but uh, I guess maybe being on as a character or as an under five, as they say, someone with five lines or under, uh, was was perhaps a consolation prize. But it was one I was uh, very grateful for. So that's kind of my Parks experience in a nutshell. And again, my name is Chris Regan. I am a comedy writer. Uh, watch Family Guy, if you can. I've been a writer on that show for 11 seasons now. Um, and uh, you can find me on Twitter, and as much as I'm on Twitter much anymore, at Chris R. Regan. I'm on Instagram at C.R. Regan. I'm on Blue Sky at, well, whatever that address is. It doesn't seem to be terribly active. But, yeah, um, uh, watch Family Guy, and uh, thanks for listening. Yay! Okay, so I hope that you guys heard that. That was Chris Regan. Also, hi, Kyle. Hi, Virginia. Thank you for joining. Um, that was Chris Regan. And in the last uh, episode, again, this is not in order if you're listening on the podcast. Uh, okay, you'll hear, you'll hear Phoebe, okay? I always want to close the door, but then I'm like, don't be mean. She doesn't want to have the door closed on her. <sighs> anyway, so you'll hear her. I have a blanket. Okay. Um, anyhow, so that was Chris Regan, and he played one of the political pundits that's on Purd uh, when, when uh, Catherine Hahn joins the cast. And, uh, so yeah, so he's a writer on Family Guy. I love that he called his trailer a camper, because they are campers. They are campers, but I just never hear anyone say that. So that's really fun. Um, but, yeah, let's follow him. I'll tag him, obviously, um, once I, you know, once this episode comes out and in all the show notes and all that stuff. But he did a great job. I thought they did a great job of his hair and all the things that he was talking about as far as like how they styled him and made it very like 90s Fox News almost kind of vibes. Um, Very choice. Okay. Anyhow, all right, so that was a recap from last episode. Now we're moving into this episode. Um, If you haven't noticed, Maddie is not with me, um, but she will be hopefully soon. And um, so she'll send in a summary. I'll play a summary in a moment. But for now, what? You guys. uh, Lucky, season four, episode 18. This was written by Nick Offerman. Okay? The one, the only Ron Swanson. Hello? Hello? What? What the Hank? Yeah, this was written by Nick Offerman, only time writing. So this is his only writing credit. In fact, it was his first writing credit. But he goes on to write, uh, I think it's like four books now. Um, And we actually saw a glimpse a couple of episodes ago when Anne and him are sitting on the bench in his office. Um, It's like, I forgot what the name of it is. It's like one man in his canoe or something like this. Life, living life as a, ah, shit, I forgot what it is. But um. Totally go read that. But he, you know, he goes on to write books. He's written one with Megan Mullally, his lovely wife, um, a.k.a. Tammy. So amazing. Amazing. This was directed by Troy Miller, who we love and have seen so many times in so many episodes. He directed Jack Frost. Oh, my gosh. Did you guys ever watch that movie? (sighs) Michael Keaton, old like 90s, early 2000s movie. Brilliant. So sad. So beautiful. But oh, my God. Um, but yeah, Troy Miller, we love. Uh, this is Troy Miller's last episode directing Parks, but we have seen him many times before. He's done so many amazing episodes. We've got Ron and Tammy, Road Trip, uh, I'm Leslie Nope, more than that. Like, great job. He does also direct a ton of comedy specials and segments. Like, he's done a segment on the Oscars, things like that. He's also a producer. So great job, Troy. Okay, so this is where our summary would come in. So this is where Maddie will has already sent in her summary. Side note, I'm not editing any of this. <laughs> this is, I really hope I don't have to like pee or anything. So not that you guys needed to know that. But, you know, what I say is what I say. <laughs> and I'm not going to edit this for when it actually comes out on, like for when it's released either. So bear with me. Okay, so here's the summary for Lucky. Yay, a live podcast. I'm so excited um, to be coming to you. Unfortunately, I'm not live, but I'm so excited to see how this live experiment goes. And I am here to give you a summary for this wonderful episode. So Leslie, Ann, and Tom try to blow off some steam by going out for drinks after an interview falls through. But when the interview is back on, a few margaritas and and tequila shots later, Leslie is going to need some real luck for her performance to not crush her campaign. Andy completes his first college course, and Chris and Ron are both interested in his professor. Meanwhile, Donna watches Jerry complete government work twice. Um, I absolutely love this episode, Um, mainly, I think, because in the end, we really learn that there are people in the town willing to help Leslie the way that she has helped them. And I think that's so few and far between in in the series, where 
we see the town really appreciate who she is and what she's done for them. So I think this is just such a wonderful moment um, for them to help kind of save her campaign from this disaster. Um, I'm totally on Leslie, Ann, and Tom's side here um, where they, uh, you know, they, they need to blow off some steam. They've been working really hard. Um, but I think they're, you know, it ends up coming to bite them in the ass. Um, this little side plot of Ann and Tom at this being the longest they've been together for 48 hours, I think is hilarious. And it's also like, we've talked about in the past, Holly, like, why are they together? Like, this is a huge red flag. If you're only staying together for less than two days at a time, like, are you really supposed to be dating? Um, and then I also have, I wanted to hear your thoughts, Holly. So when you get there in the episode, um, I wanted to chat about this whole, should Ron tell Chris thing? Um, is it really his business? There wasn't really, you know, they didn't even go on a date or anything like that. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. I do enjoy, I do appreciate the sentiment of, you know, Chris is in a low, low place right now. So Ron, you should maybe, you know, at least let him know that Linda's not in the place to be dating right now. Like, Hey, this is kind of where she's at. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just interesting to me too, like that, that needed to be shared. So, um, I don't know. I wanted to talk through it cause I, I'm not sold on a certain position, but was interested to have dialogue around it. Um, love this side plot with Donna and Jerry. Um, my favorite, favorite line that sometimes I use in this episode is when Andy is in his test, um, his conversation test basically is what it is with his professor and he answers and says, treat please. Um, I absolutely love it. And I'm so proud of Andy for this accomplishment. So I hope you all enjoy the uh, recollection of this episode. And um, I know Holly's going to smash it. And I hope this live thing goes well so that when I come back, we can do some. Yay. Uh, Yes, we will definitely be doing more. Uh, Well, I hope so. Anyhow. Okay. Um, Yeah. I'll get there when I get there, but no, you know what? We're here. Why not talk about it? Um, I already told Maddie a little bit about this, but the whole thing of like Chris or uh, Ron telling Chris that he had consensual relations with uh, the professor, I feel like it was the right thing to do. I mean, if they hadn't had a lunch together and they hadn't been kind of like, I don't know, talking together all in the same table. And also if Ron didn't like know Chris, like if you or if he had just started working with Chris, maybe um, because like that's none of your business if I don't even know you. But like Chris has been like really depressed and he said outright, I'm going to try to pursue this when Ron knows like that that's not going to happen and they aren't necessarily friends, quote unquote. But I think there's a respect there. um, And I think that's the right thing to do. So. You guys can disagree with me if you want to, but I think it was nice of Ron and a nice little arc moment. Um, And yes, love Donna in this episode. So amazing. We'll get there when we get there. Um, Okay. Also, Jumbo Margaritas. (laughs) I am so obsessed with that name. I don't know that I've seen a... I'm sure I've seen a Jumbo Margarita. I've had to at some point, but I just don't feel like I've had a Jumbo Margarita in a minute or a flaming tequila shot on a random ass Tuesday or whatever the heck they are, whatever day it is. Um, Anyhow, I would like some of those. Okay, so let's get into the episode. Okay, so this uh, cold open is amazing. Leslie is trying all the different interview outfits. I um, have been asked before what my favorite cold open is, and I do have to say that one of them is where she is rapping Parents Just Don't Understand. Like, the whole cold open, it's like a good two minutes long. Uh, Parents Just Don't Understand. And (laughs) and after she's done, Ron is like, someone's on fire in the park. And that one's so funny. But this one? Mm, close second man all of these are beautiful and wonderful um all these outfits what i mean to say um but anyway this really reminded me too of if you watch the office the fashion show fashion show fashion show at lunch uh but it's not at lunch there is a deleted scene here okay where they share that they went to a store called lady place and they have like 15 bags that they're all carrying uh and by all i mean tom and uh, and Leslie all come in carrying 800,000 bags with the the title Lady Place on the bags. A place for ladies. And Leslie says that in the deleted scenes, which is amazing. Um, and then Tom, it's kind of weird. Tom is like, yeah, mommy went to Lady Place. And whenever something went out of style, she returned it. Mommy? 
He's literally saying mommy. Um, and Anne calls him out on that. But I noticed it too. Before she even said that, I was like, mommy? Okay. Which, what is Tom's backstory with his family? Where, what, hmm. Have we talked about that? Am I crazy? I mean, I know he's from one of the Carolinas, which I think they pulled from his real life because Leslie's asking where he's from, like what his, uh, you know, what his um, ethnicity is or whatever. And he's like, I'm from South Carolina. But I do wonder what Tom's backstory is with family. Um, Phoebe's wanting to talk. She wants to know, too. So I'm going to let Phoebe talk. Um, OK, so let's see. Um Blah, blah, blah. Um, oh, I was wondering, too, uh, wouldn't the clothes be, like, sweaty or, like, dirty or bad or something by the time it went out of fashion? So, like, mommy couldn't return it anyways. Also, is this where Tom got his uh, rent-a-swag idea? Hmm? Some little family inspiration there, maybe? I don't know. Um, maybe she was only wearing the stuff for, like, a week, though. So maybe that's how the rent-a-swag thing kind of got in, in in his head. I don't know. But anyway, um... Okay, so uh, I did ask Kirsten Mann, who was the costume designer for this episode and for this series, rather. We actually interviewed her, so if you're interested in talking to her, uh, please go and listen to that episode. I will link it in the show notes when this comes out, or I'll post it again or whatever. She's amazing. Um, But I emailed her, and I asked her if she had any memories of this day. Um, And her email said, Hi, Holly, I do remember that day. It was so much fun, and Amy looked good in everything, no matter how wacky. And as I said before, she's game for anything. A costume designer's dream. Um, And then she asked if Amy had directed that one. Um, But no, Troy Miller did. Because Amy has written and I believe directed a couple episodes too. But um, but yeah, I mean, that sounds so like Amy Poehler. Like she'd just be down to try on anything. She has this yellow dress with the huge belt, this American like beanie thing with the flag. And she dresses like Sandy from Grease, which is one of my all-time favorite outfits that Leslie has ever worn in my entire life with the little red like neck scarf thing um and yeah this is where I wrote in my notes before the deleted scenes I was like how did she get all these outfits does she just have them she bought them specifically for this um but it must have been so fun to play dress up like that um we'll talk about the nympho thing in a moment (laughs) okay um she says she has this talking head where she says to win an election you have to be good and you have to be lucky and lucky is the name of the episode And don't we just love, well, I'll say, I'll speak for myself, don't I just love when an episode or a movie or a book even has the title of the thing in a line of the thing. Isn't it great? Isn't it? All right. Uh, Okay. So, yeah, Lucky is the name of the episode. Um, And Buddy Wood, who we don't know who Buddy Wood is at this point. We don't know that it's Sean Hayes. We don't know. We're getting there. Um, Yes, that is a spoiler. If you're not... I should have had a disclaimer. Most of you already know, but this podcast is not a watch along as if you've never seen it before. It is a watch because you've watched it 8,000 times. But we do take newcomers, so (laughs) come on in. Anyhow, uh, Buddy Wood is the number one morning show in Indianapolis and is doing a series on local elections, so he wants to interview Leslie, which is a huge break for them. This is a big deal, especially for this local election. Like, city council is a big deal in Pawnee, but like... To have it be broadcast over Indianapolis, big deal, big deal. And then we'll find out soon who Betty Wood is. Uh, Ben is showing a very nervous and anxious side to him. I mean, he's kind of always had this side, but this is like he is stressed and weird and just like not good energy coming off of him at all. He's like, um, maybe we'll put a pause on this and focus on interview topics. Uh, and I just love that she uh, is like, no, 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 it's fine. Just keep going. <laughs> I can do both at the same time, which is true. But, uh, you know, just shows how much she wants to do this. But I love this next line. I think it one, might be one of my favorite lines from this episode is, um, Uh, He says, like, what are you going to do to work for the public or whatever? And she's like, I don't know, but I bet these pants will work for the public. (laughs) I don't think at the time they had the slang of W-E-R-K, but she invented it right here or she used it right here. So who did invent W-E-R-K? Was it work, work, work? Was it Rihanna? No, I don't know. Anyhow, she does say that. (laughs) Um. And I love that Ben can't resist smiling at this. Like, he is very nervous and, like, not into this. But then he's like, okay, I'll, I'll smile a little bit at that. I can't. 
Um, and at this point, she's just having fun. I think like the yellow outfit, I do think she thought that was a serious thing she was like um we're like uh, this is professional right with even with the american hat that's fine um and this time though with her little grease outfit i think she's just like i'm hot i'm confident i gotta show them you know this is what i'm doing but i guess she didn't discover when she (laughs) was trying this on that the back of her pants say nympho in silver (laughs) sparkly letters and tom's delivery aziz's delivery is phenomenal nympho means you're addicted to sex and since it's on the butt there's other implications so that's a maybe (laughs) so lovely it's so funny tom is such a sleazeball in most of the time uh, or most of the episodes but you got to give it up for that that was really funny um But yeah, and it really actually reminded me of, I don't know if you guys watch Friends, for those of you who know me, you know, but if you don't, I can quote Friends front, back, sideways, whatever. Like, it's one of those shows that I have on the background all the time. I haven't in a while, but it's also a show that I, this is random, but I watch it in Spanish, actually, which is a really good idea. If you know a show, like every single one of their lines, watch it in a different language and you will learn so much because they do their slang differently and it's just like more conversational and maybe not as, you know, classical, if that makes sense, like in a class, classical class. Anyways, um, but so it reminded me, if you do watch Friends, where Ross had, like is going shopping with Rachel and Phoebe, um, and he has this leather jacket that he tries on, and he's like, oh my god, this looks great. And then he turns around, and it says, um, boys will be boys, in silvery, sparkly letters. So I don't know where that joke came from, or who, why they, it's such crossover that I notice in between all these shows. But um, side note, for the Super Bowl, there is an Uber Eats commercial that Ross and Rachel are in. So good. So we'll talk about that later. Okay, Uh, let's see. So April and Ron are now helping Andy study for his college courses. So exciting and so sweet for Andy. He's taking this so seriously. Um, Like he's shaved. He is clean shaven. He's wearing a nice shirt and tie. It's very professional, very studious. And um, I just love that for him. And like Maddie said in her summary, we're just really proud of him because he's come so far, I feel, from not taking anything seriously and like bathing in a baby pool (laughs) to taking a college course (laughs) so nice um Laura Mulvey is one of the people that they mention because he is taking a women's film study class. And she, for those of you who don't know, or maybe you have heard her name, or maybe you just know everything about her, um, I just wanted to do a brief reminder that she was a film theorist and she invented the term the male gaze. I don't think I knew that part. I knew, uh, this so sounds silly, I guess. I should have known because I knew that she was like in the film, like entertainment, like critiquing world, but I don't know that she... I should, that's the part you should know that she invented male gaze. But anyway, um, I, I, I just learned so much about women in parks. It's the best. I love it so much. Um, Mel, Mulvey argued, though, drawing on psychoanalysis, that Hollywood cinema was structured along a threefold gaze by the audience, the camera, and the characters that looks at women from a male point of view and regards them as mere sexual objects. Um, and she really studied this like I said it was psychoanalysis like she did a huge essay on it and it just became very popular um so we have her to thank for that term which is wonderful and later in the episode Chris says that term which that had to have been on purpose right and I never noticed that so I think that's really smart um But as Andy says, she was famous for her essay that she wrote on this and it was called visual pleasure and narrative cinema Ooh, ah Written in 1973, published in 1975 in the influential British film theory journal Screen, capital S, Screen. Um, And it was influenced by the theories of Sigmund Freud, you know who that is, and Jacques Lacan, you know, another psychology person. Um, I'm sorry if I I didn't actually look up Jacques Lacan. I'm so I like as far as his 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 contributions to everything, but. Sigmund Freud in that circle. Okay. Correct me if you want to. Um, But uh, anyway, Laura Mulvey has written a lot of critiques and observations about a ton of movies. She actually wrote a really famous one for Citizen Kane. And she's still living. She's still kicking. She's 82 years old. So she's still around doing things. Thank you for your service, Laura. We love you. Um, But it's really funny because Andy is like, Laura Mulvey was a man. No, girl. Women's studies. (laughs) 
Um, but I do love that this is literally the golden retriever boyfriend because they're giving him treats, as Maddie said in her summary, too. Like, they're he is actually a dog that needs a treat. Um, is it on? Is it on now? Hello? Okay, sorry. I don't know what happened. Okay. Hopefully people are still in. Okay. Um, so anyways, he's literally like a dog. And I just love it so, so much. Um, all right. So let's see. It's an oral exam, meaning that you have to speak about the topic. Um, I don't know if you guys ever had those kinds of exams in high school. I think it is more of a college thing of like how intellectual can you really apply this to your daily life kind of vibes. Um, but it's just Pratt's delivery <laughs> of this talking head of like, well, it's an oral exam, so I should be good. And if there's one thing I'm good at it, it, of my fantastic, it's talk. <laughs> it's so good. Uh, and then he starts to get scared and he's like, I'm just going to bail. And April is like, just if you get nervous, just say, oh, my gosh, you changed my life about any woman, which to be fair, not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea. <laughs> um, and Ron is like, no, you have to face your fears head on. Like, we don't back out. We are strong and we're going to we're smart. We're going to do it. Um, and that will come back later to kind of bite Ron, but also help Ron. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Anyways, um, all right, so now we are landing on an outfit finally. Leslie comes out of her fashion show, and it's really beautiful, actually. I think it is. I mean, it's just like a con – I love all of Leslie's pantsuits. I love all of her business suits. I love all of her – like, she doesn't wear dresses um, that often, but she – I just – I love the gray color of a lot of her suits. Like, I know that's weird and whatever, very detailed, but I think that it's great. And Kirsten Mann, who did the costumes – Good for you and your team. Okay, so this is the first time that we see Jerry and Donna doing the envelopes in the background, which is great. Love this so much. Um, Leslie, I don't know why she's suggesting so many random additions to the outfit. A bowler hat, an edgy scarf. Is there such a thing as an edgy scarf? Maybe. I'd love to see it. Um, I'm imagining those like tiny little scarves that like Misha Barton from the OC used to wear. <laughs> Like Jessica Simpson kind of vibe. That's what I'm imagining is an edgy scarf. Um, or maybe like the red scarf, the infamous Taylor Swift red scarf. That's edgy. Okay. All right. Um, ben is really wound up and tight and tense, and he's just like, oh, let's just go no nonsense. Like, let's just be super cash, like super professional. I mean, not cash, super professional. And um, this is where we learn. Oh, my God. This is where we learn that Tom and Anne are still dating for whatever the F reason. Can I curse on a live? I mean, I have. But can I say the F word? I don't know. Um, anyway, she's laughing at his jokes, though. And I'm like, what? Why? Like, whatever. They're doing their thing. They've gone 30 hours without breaking up. 47 hours is their personal best because she went out of town and they she forgot that they were even together. Ugh. Why are you doing this? Uh, I mean, I get it, though. That is funny. It is very comedic for a comedy show. Just are we done yet with this storyline? OK, anyways, um, yeah, it's just not a good thing when you forget that you were dating somebody. So, OK. Um, we get the news, though, sad news, that Buddy has to pull out of the interview because there was a factory fire that he has to cover. And Leslie immediately is inappropriate. Did anyone even get hurt? The fuck? Oh, I said it. <laughs> um. Anyway, so no one got hurt, I guess. Or maybe people did get hurt. But he has Buddy has to go cover that. Um, And she says sorry. She does say sorry. She apologizes. But Ben is just so upset and disheartened. And so he just keeps pushing like, you know, we just got to work harder. We just got to do our thing. We got to keep going. And I actually really relate to Ben in this in this brief moment. Like, OK, we had a setback, but we keep going. We keep working hard. We don't rest. We don't reward ourselves. Let's just keep going. Like, don't even celebrate the fact that we even had the interview in the first place. Like, let's just like get effed up about the fact that it's destroyed now. You know what I'm saying? Um, and. So he's like, well, we can come back. We can come back. And he just does not know really what's going on in his head. I think he's just so 
gone, you know. Um, but they, uh, they, you know, they decide to get a drink anyways. And I, I do feel like it's good. I wrote this in my notes, too. I mean, well, I wrote everything in my notes. But it's great to see the kind of balance that we are getting between Leslie and Ben. Because I feel like Leslie is usually the one that has that mindset of, like, we have to just keep going. I've made a binder about this. We have to, you know, say what we're going to say what we said we were do what we said we were going to do. You know what I mean? We have to just keep working hard and I'm going to make a bigger binder and I'm going to stay up all night and figure out how what the next big thing is after Harvest Festival. You know, like I feel like Leslie is usually the one to do that. But now Ben is. And now Leslie's the one saying, let's get a drink. Let's like blow off some steam let's like celebrate what how much we've worked on this and so I do think that's really interesting in their relationship to kind of see that dynamic back and forth um and okay I have a beef with this next quote joke I suppose you could say (laughs) I've always thought about um Tom's joke about boring club not making sense because he said Ben lost the election of the boring club because his speech was too boring and I'm like doesn't that mean that he would win? If it was too boring? Does the boring club want a non-boring person? Make it make sense. Anyway, that was a long pause. Okay. Uh, there is a blue lava lamp in the back. Um, I thought that everyone should just take note of that. That is a thing. Uh, Leslie's like, listen, forget it. I look hot. I have pre-interview adrenaline. Let's go get a drink. This was after Ben leaves and is like, I'm just going to turn in early and then we can do our campaign run tomorrow. Um, Like handing out, uh, what's that called? Lobbying kind of vibes. Anyway, um, so now we are back at Andy taking his exam and he's so tense. He's so rigid. He's really trying so hard to recite these facts just as if it's in like a dictionary or any other kind of, you know, thesaurus. Like that's how, I don't know, you know, rigid it is and how uh, not conversational it is. Um, And then he says, treat please to Professor Linda, which is hilarious because he's like, you know, back to Sigmund Freud. Um, Although it's not Freud, it was Pavlov. Pavlov's theory, you know, treat please. So that was really hilarious. Um, And the teacher's like, look, you're taking this pass fail. Slow down. Just tell me what you thought of the class in, you know, a free wheeling kind of manner. Not a big deal. Uh, And also how cush is that? Like, how nice is that? That's really nice. Like, how many classes are like that? Is it? Mm, I'm curious, you know. Um, I think it's more than we think, especially if it might be at a community college. I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying that, like, that's what I've heard. I don't know. I don't know. Tell me if I'm wrong. So now it's funny because now he's just reciting the same facts, but in a casual manner. <laughs> Like, all of the same. Susan B. Anthony was, like, you know, born in Massachusetts. So, whatever. And it's, like, really hilarious. Just one man's opinion. Um, But he passed. And he got a P. Hoping for a P plus. But that does not exist. Um, I did pause on the bulletin board. As you know, I love to pause. And see what's in the background. And I couldn't get everything. Because they did a great job of filling that thing to the brim. There are so many pieces of paper stuck on that bulletin board. Um, which is totally accurate for a college campus, I feel. Um, so, But I did get a couple of things. First things first, I saw a waffle fundraiser. There's always a waffle something or other, okay? There was this at the... Um, the uh, oh my gosh, the model UN, the model UN in the background, there was a big sign in that like space where they were doing the model UN. And I don't know if it was a fundraiser or if it or, or what it was, but it said it was some event centered around waffles. So I'm just telling you, there's waffles like on all the fundraising, which great way to raise money. Can't knock it. All right. There's also puppies for sale on this bulletin board. And the paper says cute, adorable, need a loving home. Um, There's a film TV club. Um, There is a sign that says stop bullying now, which I think is a club that, you know, try to do that. And um, oh, there's a paper that says we buy used college textbooks. So and there's also um, a 10 speed bike for sale. If anybody wants to ride their bike to the waffle fundraiser, get on it, you know. Um, Andy thinks he's graduated college. He's like, Ron, I am now a college graduate. (laughs) And I love that April's like, no, no. But he corrects himself and says, I'm a college course graduate. And it's because of you. 
And Ron suggests a steak to celebrate. Um, Ron is really precious. I just love this moment between them when Ron is like, um, I'm really proud of you, you know? And it's really nice. I mean, he doesn't say it in that Holly voice, but you get me. Um... Anyhow, so they invite the professor, actually, because she's like, okay, bye, like, have fun at your steak, whatever. And I'm kind of just like, "Mm, why? Like, should they? I I don't know. I mean, that's nice to, like, be invited, but I don't know if I'd feel like going to um, celebrate my pass with my professor that gave me the pass. I don't know. But it's, it's also Andy, though. Andy gets along with everybody. He's like... Who cares? You know what I'm saying? Um, and like everyone's welcome here kind of thing. So I, I get it from Andy's point of view um, because he was the one that invited her. But to me, it was like kind of awkward. Uh, and then I lo- well, I don't love, but it's kind of funny that April um, as they're walking out is like, are you going to wear that <laughs> to the professor when she's dressed beautifully and looks beautiful like she's ready to go and would look be in place with anyone. All right. So um Moving on, where are we now? Um, oh, I love this line. We'll let you pay for your own food because of equality. That's nice. <laughs> um, all right, reminder, side note, speaking of, that this professor is played by Danielle Bissetti. I think that's how you pronounce her name. Um, she's done some amazing work. We actually contacted her during the strike, and it was just a lot going on. There were strike guidelines, all these things, um, and you know, we wanted to be careful with not T- speaking too much about the a, sh- a SAG show during the SAG strike and all these things, um, which I get. And um, she has done a lot of mocap, uh, motion capture, if you're not f- familiar. Um, she was in the video game God of War, Ragnarok. I don't know if anyone plays that, but she plays Freya in uh, God of War as uh, the voice. And I was like, what? And she does some mocap for that one as well. She does a ton of... Um, of, of voiceover work, which is wonderful. Um, she has done some Disney things. She's on Madden. She's done uh, a couple music videos, some shorts, um, a lot of other TV shows too. So great working actress here. And we did, I did reach back out to her and ask her if she wants to talk because this is her last episode. Um, and she is interested. So hopefully we'll have a moment from her. Uh, and I think we'll, we're going to hop on zoom together somehow. Maybe, 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 maybe. Um, and I'll obviously share that with you guys. Oh my gosh, Donna. Donna gets some amazing moments here. Um, she and Jerry are doing the envelope mailer campaign thing. And she um, is, is so, oh, I just love it. She has a date with a bathtub. I love this so much, this line. She has a date with a bathtub, red wine, and a gigantic fireman named Marcus. Oh, what a lucky guy Marcus is. Am I right? Am I right? <sighs> Anyhow. Um, yeah, she calls it. Basically, she's like, okay, I'm going to go leave and all this. And then Jerry is like, uh, I'm just going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep working. I'm going to keep doing this. And he loves this work. What? He's so happy. It's so intriguing. And Donna, for whatever reason, wants to stay. Um, <laughs> like Donna's face is my face, like where she looks into the camera like, this makes no sense. What? Um, also, he's licking every envelope boo <laughs> stop it they have thing i maybe they didn't have them in the past i'm sure they did though where um they make the env- like the little things that make the envelope wet so you don't have to do it anymore <laughs> like i don't like that he's licking every envelope it's just not right okay okay so um leslie tom and ann are getting wasted at the bar which is coincidentally called scully's and that's named after mike scully who writes on the show and has been on the show as an actor before as well as a guest star which is wonderful um so this is where ann is making fun of ben and it's actually really good she does a good impression honestly (laughs) and um she's like saying that he was really boring and no nonsense like we should just get a more sensible drink and leslie is like you know i love him but the campaign is just making him so wound up freaked out definitely stressed it's very stressful you know um (laughs) this is where they're basically tipsy almost drunk before the flaming shots and ben is like a milf (laughs) which (laughs) that makes me laugh a lot um because it's just wrong. But anyways, um, 
I capital love this little relationship moment, though, between Tom, Anne, and Leslie. Like, I'm so obsessed with this kind of affirmation and friendship and relationship. Like, Anne is all, you need to blow off some steam, and he should just get that. And Tom is like, you're Leslie Nope. No one takes this more seriously than you do. Tell me about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's so nice because... Did I show you guys this already? I think I might have. Where, like, the first, yeah, the first season is just them three together. And I think, we've talked about this before, they didn't really know what to do with Donna, Jerry, April, Andy. Andy wasn't even supposed to be there. Chris and uh, Adam Scott weren't even there. So, like, this moment, I feel like, between the three of them, this, like, core moment that Tom is not being a sleazeball like he was in season one and knows who the hell she is. Leslie's now running for city council. It's just nice to see. It's really beautiful. So just wanted to share that with you. Um, okay, let's see. What else is happening? Um, let's see. Okay. Oh, 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 the flaming tequila shots. This is where the tequila shots uh, come in. And I just think it's amazing because, I, like I said, I did not anticipate them getting totally smashed when they said they needed to blow off steam. I was like, oh, maybe they'll get a little tipsy. They'll have a couple, like, beers or whatever. But, like, flaming tequila shots and jumbo margaritas on a random ass Wednesday or whatever the hell, whenever the hell they're doing this. Like, but I get it at the same time because it's not just, like, drinky drinks it's like hanging out drinks it's like we've been working really hard and we had this really great win yeah we lost the interview but like we're still doing great you know what I'm saying it's great um also I was gonna say too I wrote this in my notes like you know that relationship between Tom Ann and Leslie I feel like that kind of relationship sober is awesome too like I feel like shouts to Mia Mia's in here Sean hi oh my god I'm going to start performing now. No, I'm just kidding. Um, But no, Mia, Chris, and I, who have all been on the podcast, have this relationship, I feel like, together, (laughs) like, sober, too. Like, uh, you're, like, so perfect. You don't even understand. And I just love that. Um, So, anyhow, now she's getting a phone call. Hello, Lady Nope. I mean, Leslie Nope. And it's Ben saying that the interview (laughs) is back on. And um, I can't tell, like, they're, you know, Ben's asking, where is she? What's happening? Um, And (laughs) she's saying, I'm at home watching TV. And I can't tell what Anne suggests when she says, like, say you're watching this or whatever. It might have just been gibberish. But Tom suggests, say you're watching Murder, She Wrote. (laughs) So random. Um, Which is kind of a callback, actually, because I don't know if you guys remember the line where she says that in high school they used to call her Angela Lansbury. But it was, like, because of her haircut or whatever. (laughs) And Murder, She Wrote is Angela Lansbury. So a little callback. Don't know if the writers meant to do that, but they're doing it. Um... All right, so then we get news, like I said, that the interview is back on. God, Leslie needs to get to the airport as soon as possible. Yay, we're so drunky. I mean, lunky. Oh, God. They're all like, oh, God, what are we going to do? We're totally effed. It's too much. Um, And I love the way that she twirls her phone on the table. Like, that was brilliant. I'm sure that was just Amy Poehler doing that. I don't think that was, you know, scripted, if you will. Um. In a deleted scene, though, it's actually great because in a deleted scene, she pulls out her sober chart. Remember the sober chart that she gives to Ron in the episode where he says that he can drink like 12 glasses of whiskey and be totally fine? She pulls out the, the same chart and she's like, you know, according to this, I should be fine if I was 220 pounds. <laughs> and Leslie is not 220 pounds. So um, that's really cool. I mean, I know why they cut it, but I like that they they bring a lot back in this episode. Um. This is where Tom has a great idea. Tom does have some good ideas in this one. I'll give him that. He says he still has the rental on the hot tub. So the hot tub uh, Hummer limo thing. So they could use that to get to the airport. Because I love this detail about the town. Both cabs are busy. (laughs) There's only two cabs. And Uber and all that stuff was not around. And even if it was, I'm sure it would not be necessarily in Pawnee. So there's that. Um, okay, so now they have food. It was commercial break. Now they have food. Leslie's chugging water. She's doing the drunk nose test thing to see if she can, like, handle being standing up. Um, Anne is drunk, totally, and doing the diddly 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 swag thing. And this is not romantical to me at all. <laughs> this is like, we're buds. Like, we're finally, like, just buddies now. 
moving on. I'm going to just move on. You've heard my opinion. Ann and Tom should be over at this point, but I get why they're doing it for comedy. Move on. Okay. <sighs> 33 hours. <laughs> how long they've been together. <laughs> um, Anne has the idea to do a practice interview and for like, you know, just to make sure that Amy or Leslie rather can handle herself with Buddy. And for some reason, she's speaking in a Russian accent. Leslie, <laughs> in your humble opinion. <laughs> I just, I saw a piece of Amy and Rashida in this, just being friends, like laughing together. And uh, just, you know, not as Anne and Leslie, but as castmates, as like coworkers, as friends, you know. And I, I just really love that because they are friends outside of the show. So I just saw them laughing together. And that was really fun to me. Um, because it does make total sense. And it really shines on camera you can see that they're close um I do wonder though and I need to ask somebody I don't know who I would even ask but I need to know if that was scripted that Rashida be in a Russian accent or if that just came out of her um I could see Rashida doing that I guess but I also definitely could see a writer doing that um so I I don't know but either way I'm glad it happened okay So now we're eating uh, at this restaurant with Andy and the team and the professor. And Andy says um, Ron was the inspiration for one of his papers in the class that he just got a P in. And I love that phrasing. That was one of your most readable papers. (laughs) What a compliment. (laughs) Um, Which, like, can you imagine? Oops. Can you imagine reading one of Andy's papers? Like, can we just briefly picture that for a moment as him being a golden retriever needing a treat every time like was it just one sentence was it like a paragraph if that (laughs) hilarious okay uh so we get into the topic of ron not being an anythingist because professor linda's like oh according to andy you're quite the feminist blah 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 and he goes on to say how he was raised by powerful women. And now that we have met Ron's mom, you can totally see her punching his dad in the face for saying that Eve came from the <laughs> rib of Adam. Um, and there is a deleted scene here, actually. So in the, you know, released episode, they kind of pan away uh, as Ron is talking. Um, but in the deleted scene, they focus on they focus more on what Ron continues to say, like more stories about how uh, apparently there was a foreman at the steel mill who was a woman, <laughs> a forewoman rather. Um, but he doesn't say forewoman. He just says foreman. Um, and the forewoman saved his life. And he also so randomly says, and Serena Williams is excellent. So <laughs> I think that's really lovely to know that Ron is a Serena Williams fan. Um, and then in the name of fairness, I think, or maybe just honesty, um, Ron is like, but not all women are great. My two ex-wives are both bitches. And then he goes on on this like super long tangent of how they're bitches and all the things that they've done before to him that are really terrible. Um, anyhow, so that was the deleted scene. But back to the regular episode, April spots Chris sitting alone at the bar. And Andy is like, yeah, that really looks like Chris, but there's no way to know. We'll just have to ask him tomorrow. <laughs> how did he pass this class? It was just memory memorization, though. That was being book smart for a brief second. Maybe not street smart. He's combining the two. You guys We're learning. Um, and yeah, it was super funny. So April goes over to him and he says, like, you know, he, he's like, I'm not eating alone. I have tons of friends, friends I haven't met yet. Which is like such a twofold sentiment. It's like super sweet and nice that he thinks that. But it's also like. That's sad. That's depressing. (laughs) Um, And he's reading a book about a woman who tried to swim the English Channel with no arms or legs. And that delivery is so good. After April says, um, that's impossible. I just love um, Chris or Rob Lowe's delivery of, oh, she drowned immediately. (laughs) So good. Um, Side note, I really need to watch Nyad. I have not watched that on Netflix yet. If you have, tell me um, later or now how it was. Because that's on, yeah, that's on Netflix. So I got to watch that. I have a lot of Oscar movies to watch, so whatever but speaking of that though well I mean we were already speaking about it but I'm guessing that that book it's called Lim Itless L-I-M-B Itless (laughs) which is 
brilliant, but I'm guessing that that book was created slash made by the props master Gay Perello. She has done some incredible work and does incredible puns on uh, on the book covers. It's so, so fun. Um, I can't remember what she... Um, which the last one was one of them was uh, Adam Scott's book that he's reading when he's like depressed and like just resigns in disgrace. And then the other one is um, the Air Force Nun. That's what it is. April's reading that when they're trying to do the water fountain test uh, so that people don't put their whole mouths around the water fountain. Um, but anyhow, Gay Perello, shout out to her because she has created such wonderful props and like creates amazing book covers and all these things that are just like, is that a real book? And every time I Google it, someone else has already Googled it because they're looking for the book and it's not real. (laughs) It's wonderful. Uh, Okay, so April is inviting Chris over to eat with them. And what an incredible arc for her. We already saw this with her inviting him to the movies when she won that, um, you know, competition or whatever or they made it into a competition for Leslie's campaign calling um and totally would not have done this last season um or even maybe a couple like I don't know six episodes ago you know what I'm saying like she would have pretended not to see him probably or she would have like told Andy we we gotta go we gotta leave kind of thing um but this is really nice she's like well I'm over there with people that you actually know if you want to like join us it's just like wonderful to see this arc from having watched it and analyzed it um from start to finish this is just so out of character um for early April and it's so nice it's so cute I can't harp on I'm just gonna I'll try not to harp on it too much but so nice um Anyway, Chris says bye to this friend at the bar or friend, quote unquote, and it's just this random guy at the bar (laughs) and he's like, bye. And it's so funny because this guy actually has made appearances on the show before. He actually plays, um, I think, I can't remember if he's been on it before this or if this was his first one. I don't think, I don't think it was his first one. I think he's been in town halls before. But the most memorable one for me is when they're building a paunch burger like on the lot that Leslie has wanted to save. Um, April's like, their burgers will kill you. And he's like, but they taste real good. That guy. He's been in there a ton of times. Um, And his name, actually, (laughs) they gave him the name of Bjorn Lurpus. And I'm just... (laughs) If you've listened to the show before, you know that the character names that they give to these actors are, are these characters rather, are freaking hilarious. And if you'll notice on IMDb, if you go to this episode, the waitress who doesn't even have any lines is also named last name Lurpus. So I think it's like a husband and wife team that they've just randomly created in the background and no one is meant to know this except for us nerds who, well, me nerds, well, you too, because you're here, (laughs) but (laughs) us nerds who are like looking and analyzing all this stuff, but also, I just love that his name is Bjorn. Um, so random. They're just running the town, maybe. I don't know. They're an influential couple in the town. That's what I'll say. You know? Anyhow, this guy, Bjorn, is played by Mike Mitchell. And the Parks production team, like I said, um, has wanted him or has asked him back a couple of times. Um, he was in the show Love, which I watched. And I believe it's still on Netflix. I don't know if Netflix was the primary, like, streamer or person production company for that but anyway it's on it's on there um or he was on there uh Mike Mitchell was on love it's good and he was in the tomorrow war he was in twisted metal on peacock you guys should follow him on instagram because he's he's a good follow and I actually haven't watched it uh watched twisted metal yet but he's on that um he actually has a podcast called the doughboys double so look that up too and he's also a UCB improv guy of course which makes total sense this makes so much sense why he's so funny and can just like throw those lines out so hilariously um and totally like in realm with the Pawnee world so that's him okay so now we're back where Jerry is doing the envelope work and he's like he's literally a robot on autopilot just doing his thing over and over again he's a machine he is just yeah he's basically powered by AI at this point (laughs) and Donna wants to watch this for some reason it's like so interesting to her and she cancels her bath with Marcus Marcus but this is what I also love about it. at the same time she's just like the epitome of confidence she's like Marcus can effing wait I'll get him tomorrow or literally whenever I want to <laughs> so like whatever she wants to do she's gonna do and I just think it's it, that part is really wonderful um and I love that line of like I don't know Marcus I'll hit you up when I hit you up you know it's just like I can get it 
when I want to get it. You know what I'm saying? I just love that of her. Um, and we know that Marcus will come running. So no harm, no foul to her anyway. <laughs> um, this is when Jerry is basically a glitched robot. Somebody's got to fix him because the envelope box is empty. So he's like putting his hand in putting his hand in, putting his hand in until Donna slides the full box over and he just like keeps going on. It's such a great character moment. I, this, this was so brilliant. I don't know if this was Nick Offerman's like idea. Cause you know, if you're not familiar, I'm sure most of you are, but like, if you're not familiar with the way that writing works anyway, and we've talked about this before is that like, you know, the, the writers get in a room together and break the story is what it's called. Break the story of like what we're going to write on. What's the A story? What's the B story? What's the C story? So like the writer that was credited on you know, the show, a.k.a. Nick Offerman for this episode, um, was given this to to do the outline, kind of the rough outline of of um, the stories that they pitched in the room. So I don't know whose idea this was, but he I'm sure he wrote something, you know, obviously. So I just think it's great because it's a, such a tiny little detail for him, for Jerry. Okay, so now we are where Ben is talking to an airport worker saying, like, thank you for the accommodation. Thank you for making time for us. And the worker's like, oh, my gosh, you know, for Leslie Nope, anything. Um, and I don't know if you guys caught this or if you'll catch it the next time you watch it, but she tried to shake his hand, the worker's hand. She's just like, and then he, like, pulls it away because she's drunk and he didn't see it. And it was, like, such an awkward random moment that I love seeing from Amy Poehler. Um, Leslie got them ID badges and has been really involved with making their working lives better and security and just making things better for them. Because, I mean, as rude as Buddy is, um, it is true that it needs upgrades. The airport Pawnee, like it needs upgrades. And Leslie is at the helm of that. So we're just really trying. I just love that we're seeing how much and how random. I don't think many people put the airport as part of their platform but she's putting kind of everything as part of the platform because it's part of the town you know what I'm saying so it's really lovely um the actor who says that who she takes the (laughs) she pulls his ID badge and lets it go um help me to hop out (laughs) the actor is uh Hal Havins and he's been in How I Met Your Mother Justified Westworld he's been in the crew of a lot of productions as well which is really cool um but he did a great job so we love him Okay. Now what? Time to find out who Buddy Wood is. Oh my God. Um, this was played by Sean Hayes, as we know, you all know and love from Will and Grace and Smartless, um, the podcast. Not that they need my like, you know, endorsement. Okay. They got Wondery money and Amazon Music money, and I heard Spotify money now or something. Somebody bought them, right? I don't know. Anyway, uh, but Sean Hayes is great. He was on Goodnight Oscar uh, or in Goodnight Oscar on Broadway, which he had a super big hand in doing. He's a classical pianist and it looked great. I didn't get to see it, obviously, but it started in Chicago. He'd been working on this for 100 years um, and God, it it looked wonderful. They had clips of it. It it was great. Um, But anyways, I thought it was also cool that we're kind of getting not really a crossover, but kind of a crossover because Sean Hayes, a.k.a. Jack from Will and Grace, is like BFFs with Karen, a.k.a. Megan Mullally on Will and Grace. So that's fun that they're all in this little circle together. Nice to see it. Love to see it in our little comedy world. Um, Also, I believe that uh, uh, Sean Hayes would have worked with Amy on SNL at some point because he was on SNL quite frequently. Um, Those those sketches in the the clothes store with Jimmy Fallon and Will Ferrell that Sean Hayes is in. I can't remember that like really upscale store. Anyways, so I'm sure they would have hung out there as well. Um, So yeah, you know who Sean Hayes is. I don't need to go into further detail, even though I just did. All right. Oh, one last thing. Sorry. If you haven't watched the Christmas murder thing on Netflix with all the smartless dudes, Bateman, Arnett, and Sean Hayes, um, it did not start as a Christmas one. They had a Christmas like special or whatever the hell, but um, they had, Arnett started it, I believe. Um, And there's like a bunch of different like things, uh, you know storylines that go with it but there's the Christmas one is so funny and it's basically all improvised um they have like a storyline but it's all improvised for the most part and like Sean Hayes is not good at not breaking (laughs) as you could tell from SNL if you've seen those (laughs) so that was really fun to see him really break and like Maya Rudolph comes in I think like a bunch of people come in on the Christmas one uh like lots of guests so that's hilarious okay back to Parks and Rec who did this 
Okay, um, Leslie says thank you so much. Welcome to the greatest city in the world to Buddy. And Buddy's laughing because she doesn't think he's serious, which, or she's serious, which is so sad. Um, and he definitely, Sean Hayes did a great job of this. Like, he definitely has that superior air to him. Um, I love how they did his hair. It's very lifted, very tall. And it's so, like, city. I'm from Indianapolis, and you're from a podunk town, like, four whatever hours away. It's very much that, which, like, you could totally see the differences in them. Um, also, I don't know if you guys noticed, but Leslie's hair is definitely a little disheveled, a little loose, sticking out. Great touch, a little drunken touch to that. Uh, I don't know how it got so disheveled, but I guess she was just, like, flopping all around. <laughs> um, I love this line, even though it's so shitty, is that we found a small piece of carpet without a horrifying smellscape. <laughs> oh, Lord. Um... This is where the next part is a little bit confusing to me because just as an audience member, like, wouldn't you think that Ben would notice that she is a little like not herself um, because she's straight up asks him like so and she slurs her word a little words a little bit. Um, but at the same time, they've already showed him how distracted and sidelined by everything else. So like I could see it, I guess, in if we suspend reality for a brief second, like I could see how his character would be like. Yeah, no, whatever. Like, taking a phone call. Who the hell is he on the phone with? Nobody's calling you now? I'm just kidding. Maybe they are. <laughs> He's a campaign manager, okay? Um. Anyways, so now we're back at the restaurant, and we see Chris joining the table uh, with Ron and the team. Ron orders the steak, uh, and the professor orders the spinach salad. Chris says he brings his own dressings because the professor is asking, how, like, what kind of dressings do you have? And, um... This waitress is so funny. Uh, like, you really can't be doing that. Oh, it's my last time. I promise. Which, side note, this waitress um, is named Leslie Thurston. And uh, she's done a ton of stuff. And I'm actually in contact with her agents right now. So I really hope, well, maybe I shouldn't have said that. I don't care. Um, I hope that I can get some voice memos or we can chat really briefly on uh, Zoom or something. Um And have a moment to talk to her because she's been in a lot of stuff. And I just would love to know. Because it seemed like, maybe not her first thing, but like when she was kind of... Um, you know, didn't have a 800,000 credits maybe um, before this, but I'm sure she's been working, obviously, before that. I'm not trying to say that she wasn't, but now she's been in the morning show, Fuller House. She's directed and starred in some shorts. Like, she's done a ton of stuff. Um, and so, great working actress. Love this. And and would love to chat with her about how she got the job and working with Rob Lowe and all that kind of good stuff. Um so, also, side note, that dressing really does sound good. It's like olive oil, lemon, a hint of turmeric, turmeric, however you pronounce that. Um, sounds great. So, not mad at Chris for bringing that, but it is a health code violation, I think. So, um, then April sees this interaction of dressing exchanges and um, gives them a look like they might be able to set something up romantically. So, we'll see. Okay, so now we're back at the interview, and basically Buddy Woods is insulting Pawnee, like straight up insulting it. There is no masking of this. There is no trying to be diplomatic at all. <laughs> I mean, he's saying it with a smile, but doesn't every reporter try to kind of do that? Maybe not. But anyway, he's saying the airport is decrepit. There's 19 toxic waste repositories and not much else. Um and it's very sad. And but I will say, oh, my God, Sean Hayes did a great job of this whole, you know, like I said, already the superiority thing. But like the um, kind of like Dateline almost vibe, not like, well, Dateline's more murder. But <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like the reporter kind of vibe of like, like a metaphor and not much else. What do you have to say about that? It was very nice. Um, she points out that uh, Joe Apple Demas, Leslie points out that this guy who's been working at the airport since 1996 has not had his wages raised since he started working there. And that's like a moment to think about in the episode. But to think about that in real life, because I'm going through this now where I'm job hunting and I'm like, I loved working at a coffee shop. I will work at a coffee shop tomorrow. Um, and if that's what I have to do, that's what I have to do. But I did the math. You cannot afford to live on a minimum wage. Don't even get me started. I'm already started. Anyways. Okay. Anyways. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that should definitely be illegal that it hasn't been raised, that that minimum wage hasn't been raised. And Leslie said that she's going to make the airport a um, piece of her platform to really improve this space. Um 
Joe Appledemus is played by Michael D. Roberts, and he was actually in A Star is Born, which he had a named role. I can't, I didn't write it down, I'm sorry, but it was the most recent one with Lady Gaga and um, Bradley Cooper. So I have to watch it again. Also, A Star is Born was in 2018. That's not right. When I was looking at I'm to be, I was like, that came out like two years ago, right? No. I mean, I guess COVID doesn't count, but 2018? <sighs> Time. Time, time, time. Anyhow, uh, he was also in Rain Man, Girl Meets World, Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. So I guess he was going around Disney kind of. Um, I like he was so cute, though. I mean, maybe he didn't mean to do this or, or, you know, whatever. There's not much scene study, I guess, to this. But maybe there was his little cute. Hello. It was so nice. I, I don't know. I thought it was nice to build up this little pawning world. Anyhow, um. Side note, he's using this like old timey like metal detector thing, which I think would be meant to find metal in the sand or something. Or it just looks like that. I have cousins and stuff that go to the beach and like do the metal detecting, but I guess their metal detector thing is broken at the airport, so that's what they're using, which is hilarious. Um Anyway, so like I said, uh, Buddy Wood's doing a great job of being a reporter with his like cadence and everything. Um, this is where he comes in with the airport seems like a metaphor a metaphor is which is oh god so awful and so mean um just so he like leslie is so below him um but he cuts her off like she's making points and she's kind of doing great for the state that she's in i feel and he's just rude and he's like are you familiar with the term about metaphor um and he starts like slamming pawnee really this is where he really gets into it he's like they're out of touch they're out of date that's what this is all about the town and the airport like basically suck okay he doesn't say that because he's semi-professional in his language but basically he is slamming Pawnee right in front of Pawnee's biggest fan so woof watch out um not only biggest fan but like mama cub for Pawnee so that's gonna come out um she does have a good rebuttal though like you know I hear what you're saying um it could use some refurbishments kind of thing but we're gonna work hard and we make up for it apart from this part hand working hard hard working hands <laughs> She can't get her shit together. Oh, God. Okay. Um, all right. So now we're at the restaurant again, and it seems like Chris and Professor Linda are hitting it off. They would make super babies, says Pratt, who is now in the super world, superhero world, which is kind of funny. Um, and uh, yeah, this this talking head really solidifies kind of like April's stance on Chris. Just for me, I know you guys disagree, whatever, um, where I don't know, like she says, I'll, I might never have to talk to him again if he dates her. So I'm really trying to get them together because I hate him, not because I like him, <laughs> which is not all true. OK, that's probably like, I don't know, 60 percent of it. And the rest of it is like because her heart is thawing. OK, um, anyway, so uh. But she, you know, she is being nice, saying, like, he needs this. And then Chris says the male gaze thing. This is where that comes back. Um, April says, like, you have really nice arms, which is so random. Uh, but it obviously turns Chris into saying something, like, real about working out. But anyway, April's like, do you work out? Like, you have really nice arms. And uh, Chris says, you know, I wanted to ask you about it. But, you know, I didn't want you to think I was, like, getting you with my male gaze kind of thing <laughs> I just love their looks to camera like what anyways he inspects her arms and that happens um you have extraordinary caput lateral <laughs> what a pickup line right <laughs> um a caput lateral by the way in case you didn't know is a part of the tricep in case anyone cares, there's a ton more that you can learn about it. But really, all we need to know right now is that it's part of the tricep. OK, there is uh, the tricep. OK, well, there's a little bit more. I am me after all. Um, but there's OK. Well, obviously, duh, the tricep, there are three try three parts of that uh, muscle in the arm. There's a lateral or lateral as how he says it, which I don't know. Is that how you really pronounce it? Or is he saying that to be like, you know, Latin? I don't know. Whatever. Lateral, medial, or medial is how it looks. And the long. Those three are the parts of the tricep. Um, he's just saying she's got nice arms. Okay. You got nice triceps, girl? Okay. So Ron orders a third steak. Oh, my God. 
How has he not died yet? How has he not had heart attacks upon heart attacks, stroke upon stroke, cholesterol? How has this not happened? Okay. Third steak. And then he asks to go for after dinner omelets or whatever the hell um, afterwards. Oh, my God. Okay. Moving on. Um, okay, we are back at the interview again. Ooh, here we go. This is rough, tough stuff. Buddy brings up the affair between Leslie and Ben, and she does a great job of trying to get him back on track. Um, bec- but she's truly like, I feel again, I know she's drunk, she shouldn't be, but truly, she's a practiced politician. I feel like she can do this in her sleep, she can do this drunk, she can, like, she's not doing so terribly like I feel like I would just be stumbling I would be stuttering um it well she's stuttering but like I wouldn't get any words out I would just be speaking like I'm talking to a friend not like to a reporter she's using the word platform for god's sake (laughs) refurbishments you know (laughs) anyway um she says she'd rather talk about ways to improve the town and he's like good luck with that okay you're crossing a line buddy you already said it you already said you hate us can you just Okay, then it all hits the fan. She gets the crazy eyes, as Tom says, because Buddy just keeps pushing. And he's like, I don't want to talk about the town, even though that's what he's there to talk about. He's like, I want to talk about your affair with Ben, your campaign manager, and how it was a scandal and all these things. Um, But she lets it slip. This is where she lets it slip that she's had a couple drinks, so what the hell. And then she knocks over the chair with her mic wire. And that's not because of me being drunk. That's because of the mic. (laughs) Oh, it's so awful to watch, but it's so great to watch at the same time. Um, I also do love, I mean, I know this isn't professional, whatever, but at the same time, like a part of me is like, go Leslie, because she's like, I don't appreciate your condescending tone, but what the hell? You know what I'm saying? Anyways, um, I know that's not right politically, I guess, but he's not being professional either. So, but that's what reporters are meant to do. That's what they're there for. I get it. They're there to push your buttons and get some dirt. So, and which he does. He succeeds at. <sighs> Woof. Um, but again, the way he says his last little speech, a fitting end to a complicated saga, to a story that is no longer that. <laughs> so good. Um and oh my gosh also I love that she um burps in the middle of it too that's just bad timing preposterous oh so good um all right so now Leslie's trying to reason with Buddy saying like you cannot air that please don't air that and he does like the condescending thing again um the sheep that watch this are going to eat this up like tiramisu tiramisu is an Italian (laughs) oh my god sheep don't eat it she's right about that but I do feel like now after all this has happened it kind of like sobered her up she's like surprisingly lucid in this moment um um anyways also did you guys notice I don't know if you noticed behind them there's a sign that says vending telephone and I'm like is that meant to is there meant to be a slash between the vending or do you vend a cell phone out I'm just kidding. That's not real. But I just thought that was a funny little tidbit that everything's falling apart in this airport and they do not have accurate signs or accurate metal detecting or anything at all. (laughs) So, um, oh, my gosh, there is a deleted scene here. It's so exciting and cute. And I wish they had aired it. I'm sure you can find it somewhere. But it was so funny. I wanted to keep it in. Um, Ben is so mad. He's like so frustrated and upset. Like you would I think you would want to see this if if you are a fan of the show to be like, wait, what happened, though? Um. He is, but he's trying to throw his padfolio. Like, you know how Leslie has her red padfolio? He has a black one that he's been carrying around. And he tries to throw it and slam it in the trash can. But it's one of those trash cans with, like, a little circle on the top. So he can't get it in there. And it, like, keeps bouncing and flying off of the uh, trash can. So he just keeps picking it up and throwing it. Picking it up and throwing it. I'm probably butchering it and whatever, but I hope that you find it a little bit visually funny because it is so funny and all the like papers are flying out. It's it's so good. And Leslie has this talking in afterwards and she's like, I think he's upset, but there is a chance that his pet folio was dirty. So maybe that's why he was doing that. And it's very awkward and very funny. All right. Back at the restaurant, we're almost to the end, guys. Back at the restaurant, Andy is giving a speech. Um, I love this. I want to say this. I'm proud of me, and you are too. <laughs> um, I'm going to take that class again and lock down that P+. It's impossible. <laughs> 
you and the women taught me nothing's impossible. So good. Um, and then this is where Chris asks Linda out. And she says she just got out of a relationship. So she turns him down nicely, politely. Um, and I, um, what was I going to say? Oh, I Googled. <laughs> this is so stupid. I knew it wasn't real, but I Googled land kayaking. She asks him to, <laughs> she, he asks her to go land kayaking with him. And I was like, that's not real. But is it? <laughs> and I Googled it. And the first thing that comes up in is, is a video. I'll have to link it in the show notes or something. You, you guys can Google it. But there's this like video that they did such a good job, I feel. Because it, I don't know, it just seemed so serious. But it's absolutely satire the more you watch it and the more comments you read and all these things. But there is, uh, well, yeah, there's, it's so funny. Um. There's like a documentary mockumentary moment where people are land kayaking, like making kind of a sketch of like them going down hills, go, them going um, up a tree in a kayak, like he's stuck in a tree in a kayak, like, you know, um, literally just sitting on the ground trying to, to move around. And uh, one of the comments actually is um, Chris's line of like, well, it's more grueling than fun. <laughs> you know, um, I just think it's so funny. Um, so you guys check that out on YouTube. I will post it in the show notes. But then she immediately turns to Ron after Ron suggests after dinner omelets and says, or we can go back to my place. Yes. Immediately. I I get it, though. She can do what she wants. I'm not like, ugh,ing her, if you will. Uh, Just the situation. It's (laughs) sad. It's sad. Like, if I was April or if I was at that table, I'd be like, oh, and like I basically had like what what Pratt did or Andy did where he was like, wow, <laughs> like so what a bait and switch, you know. Um, but anyways, I mean, it's not a relationship. So maybe she just wants to sleep with somebody, although I'm sure Chris would have done that, too. So she's just more attracted to Ron and Ron's obviously attracted to her because she's brunette. So. OK, Um. All righty. Let's see. Um, Oh, it is cute. I thought it was cute that Chris is teaching a morning Zuma class for seniors. That's very precious. And Chris shot a shot. You can't be mad at somebody for shooting their shot. I mean, yes, the way that Professor Linda um, turned him down was very nice and whatever. But I'm glad that he asked. I'm proud of him. You know what I'm saying? Because he's been feeling not great. And you can get really down on yourself and not confident. But ask that person out. That's so sweet. Chris. Chris. Great job. Um. And then he says he's going to try again later. Oh, OK, we'll get there when we get there. Um, all right. Leslie is apologizing about the interview to Ben. And Ben is like, if we don't get that video, it, we're dead. Like the campaign is dead. We have to go to Indianapolis and get it. I love Donna's line where Leslie uh, <laughs> work because Ben says he's going to like burn down the building or the newsroom or whatever the hell. And Leslie's like, I've never had a boyfriend commit to arson before. And, and Donna's like, it gets old. <laughs> what a life. I would love a spinoff with Donna, but not like a a Joey from Friends spinoff, like just like the accountants kind of spinoff, like two episodes and then we're done. You know what I'm saying? All right. Tom says they can take the hot tub limo so they don't have to drive all night. Another Tom and moment where they do not get each other because Tom mentions high speed skinny dipping. It's a joke. It's a joke because Anne hates this. OK, the limo driver is played by Urban Ross. Um, he was based on a true story or he was in based on a true story, um, which is the one on Peacock about the murder podcast. So good with Kaylee Cuoco. Um, you should watch that. He was also in Trial and Error, Fresh Off the Boat, Perpetual Grace. Um, I think you should leave with Tim Robinson, which I still need to watch. Very nice. Um, I also love <laughs> the comedy of Ben having to sit down, go up and give him the address. Sit back down, go up and <laughs> go up and confirm the address. It's so, so good. We actually got some voice memos from Irvin. This is the last voice memo of the night. Um, and well, there's a couple. He sent in a couple, but I'm going to go ahead and play them because they are so, so good. And thank you, Irvin, for sending those. And again, we're almost done here. So after this, we'll just be speeding right along. Um, but here is the first one from Irvin, the limo driver. Hello, my name is Irvin Ross, and I was the hot tub limo driver on Parks and Recreation. So here's the story of how I got the job on Parks and Recreation. Um, I had never seen the show, which is usually not advisable when you're auditioning for something. You'd like to give yourself a, you know, kind of a frame of reference, but I had never seen the show. I had no idea who was on it. 
And I had just got an agent and manager in the most impossible way in Hollywood. I was doing background on a show called Californication. And thanks to a clerical error on IMDb, I got full credit. So it looked like I was a recurring actor on the show. And I contacted a manager. They thought I was a recurring character. They signed me, sent me to an agent. Agent signs me. Uh, a couple weeks later, it was figured out that I was just background, but at that point, I was already under a year contract. So the first audition they send me on, my first Hollywood audition, is for Parks and Rec for being a limo driver. And I remember showing up in Hollywood and going to this audition uh, somewhere off of some side street in a neighborhood that looked a little questionable. But, you know, I was ready and willing. And I walk in and I notice everyone is wearing a suit. And I'm wearing jeans and a t-shirt. Uh, so I immediately knew I messed up right there. You know, it's my first audition and I'm like, well, okay, I did something wrong immediately. So I get my, you know, I get my thoughts collected and it's my turn. I get called to go into the room and, you know, the sides are exactly the same as you see in the show. And I walk in and I notice there's a bunch of guitars on the wall and I'm from a music background. So. I start talking about the guitars to the casting director before doing anything for the audition. And we talk for like 20 minutes. You know, she's very into music. And finally, we get to the audition. There's a chair in front of me. And I'm, you know, she's like, all right, we're going to get set up. And I take the chair and I turn it 90 degrees to my left. And she doesn't say anything. I sit down in the chair and I look over my shoulder towards the camera and I do the audition. Afterwards, she tells me I'm the only person that turned the chair. And I told her, well, don't you have to look back as a limo driver? I wouldn't be looking straight into camera. That would be awkward. You know, we'd be all in a lim limousine careening towards the edge. Uh, apparently, the producers really liked the fact that I took that extra thought and turned the chair. <laughs> I think that's what eventually got me hired for Parks and Recreation. That is so cool. I love hearing that. Oh, my God. Well, especially like the clerical error thing and like, oops. Oh, well. <laughs> um, but then you just like, it's not even about, oh, I was going to say, like, you proved yourself in a way, but like, it's not even about that. It's just like you had an instinct and you followed it and it paid off. And that's amazing. So, oh my gosh, what a great story. Okay, here's the uh, second one. So I show up on set to work on this episode of Parks and Recreation. And it is literally the most terrifying moment for me because I'm seeing all of these people that I know now, which I wish I would have watched the show beforehand. I didn't know any of them were on it, but I see like Aziz Ansari and like Rashida Jones and Amy Poehler and Adam Scott. And I see those people and I'm like, oh my goodness, they're on other shows that I've seen. And like, I, you know, these, these people are super famous. And so I immediately, I'm nervous and I'm like, okay, I know I got hired. So I know I did something right, but now I'm immediately thinking I'm going to mess something up. Uh, this will be the end of it. Uh, you know, I'll never get another job because I'll just ruin this. And I'm standing there just kind of nervously pacing, talking to myself. Like, I'm like, you could do this, you could do this. And Amy Poehler notices that I'm clearly just a little, you know, about to freak out. And she comes over to me and she says, hey, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. You know, I'm still just like kind of, you know, awestruck that she's talking to me. And she's like, what's your name? And I'm like, oh, my name is Irvin. And she said, hey, everybody. And the crew turns and looks. And she says, this guy's name is Herman. And I'm like, actually, it's Irvin. And she's like, oh, his name's Irvin. I fucked up. Go back to work. Everybody goes back to work. And I I still love Amy to this day. It's that's that moment just kind of it kind of released everything for me where it was like, OK, don't take this, like, too seriously. Like, this is a fun show. We're having fun. Like, you don't have to be nervous, you know. And I still, I so much appreciate her for taking away that anxiety that I had going into that set. Um, uh, the lines from the actual scene that you see, um, I think, I believe those were the lines in the actual audition. But there were a few takes with different lines. I don't quite remember what they were. Uh, and it's because I, I was kind of jolted when I was sitting in the, uh, the limousine as I'm sitting back there, you know, looking at everybody in the back, kind of just like, wow, there's, 
there's a bunch of Hollywood stars here. And you know how that feeling you get when something's close to you, but you can't see it? So I got that feeling, and I turned to my left, and there's Nick Offerman. And he is like a foot away from me, and it scared the hell out of me. Because I had never seen Nick Offerman. Like, it just like, it was like this bearded, like, masculine man is right next to me. And I'm thinking, oh, God, oh, God. And he's like, hey, you're doing a great job. He's like, tread a line like this. And I was like, and then he just walked away. And I was like, the hell just happened? <laughs> so, you know, I'm just like, okay, I, I did something right, but who was that? Like, I didn't know it was Nick Hoffman until after we had finished shooting. <laughs> uh, you know, the wardrobe they gave me on set, and, you know, I was only there for about one day. And uh, it was a beautiful house that we shot in front of, uh, you know, on a secluded street and everything. They block off the street. There's a whole crew. There's probably like 100 people running around. And uh, we went, did the scene, knocked it out, and uh, yeah, I said, you know, my goodbyes to everybody, and I, I went home. Which is so crazy, too, because he, Nick Offerman wrote it, so to not know, like, oh, I'm getting a note from the writer, <laughs> sounds like, oh my gosh, kind of scary, but that's great, um, whatever. And Amy Poehler, oh my god, that's so nice, just like breaking that ice, making you feel welcome, oh my gosh, I love that so, so much, that's so beautiful, oh my god. Okay. Almost done. So the infamous hot tub limousine. Um, even my, my friends and family after they watched the show had the same question about, you know, what's the deal with this? Is this a real thing? Is this a prop? And I can assure you it is a hundred percent real. I did not expect that when I got there. Um, I show up and it's this giant monstrosity of a limo. It's got this huge hot tub in the back. And the guy who owns it, you know, he does it for, like, private parties and, like, celebrities they want to rent it and go someplace or whatever. And he's there. And, you know, they have me getting this thing. And the idea is thrown around that I would actually be driving this thing. And the funny part is I didn't have a license at the time. It had expired and I hadn't got a new California license because I had just moved to California. So I'm like, well, I can't drive legally, but I'm also not going to mention that. Because whatever they want me to do, I'm going to do. This is my first gig. You know, I'm like, if you want me to drift this thing, no problems. I'm like, we can run through a 7-Eleven. Doesn't matter. I, I will do it. You know, you say, I go. And, you know, then the producers came over. They're like, no, 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 no. no there's not going to be any driving. You know, we have our, you know, we have our actors in the back. And I was like, great, because I also don't have insurance. So, you know, I'm not trying to take liability for injuring Hollywood actors. <laughs> And the limousine is super huge on the inside. It's like a, a Hummer or something. You know, I don't think I've ever been in a vehicle that big, but it was also very, very comfortable, which is, you know, a great thing, you know, good plus. We were sitting in that thing probably a couple of hours shooting that one scene, you know, getting everything right, all the camera angles, reverses, and making sure everybody's dialogue was on. And it was quite a bit of laughter from all the scenes. And, you know, the actors would throw out suggestions and all that. And uh, that limousine, uh, I haven't seen it to this day after that. And it's funny because I kind of wanted to, you know, get some friends together and rent it just to kind of have the fun of it. And I'm not sure if you could actually put the, you know, the hot tub to work while moving because I imagine the water would just slosh around, even in the terrible traffic that is L.A., uh, but that limousine uh, will always be memorable to me. That is so crazy because, you guys, if you're in Nashville at all, you may have heard of or seen um, that they have they actually do have a party bus with a hot tub in it. It is a real thing. So it does not surprise me that this hot tub is real. Um, so uh, I'm just saying that. <laughs> um, and then the very last thing is just where you can follow him on social media. So I'm just going to play that really fast. Well, since shooting on Parks and Recreation, I have actually watched Parks and Recreation. Uh, it's a fantastic show. Um, great cast, great writers, great crew. Um, really one of those shows that's a game changer, you know, in the realm of comedy. Um, I mean, how you get such such greatness together in one group, uh, it's still beyond me. Um, it will always go down as one of those amazing shows. Um, and with really, really good people on it, you know, not just Amy Poehler, who, you know, who I, I love absolutely. Um, another great person on that cast that really 
helped me out that first day was Adam Scott. I took a van ride with him on the way to set. And, you know, I'm sitting there not talking to him. You know, I had recognized him, but I was like, I'm sitting there not talking because I'm like, I don't know if I can talk to this person. I don't know if I'm allowed to. And he just started talking to me and we just started chatting back and forth. And, you know, he's an absolute sweetheart. He's a, he's a really good guy and uh, made me feel very comfortable, you know, working with these professional, you know, giants of comedy. <laughs> You know, and uh, years later, I would get to work with him again on the show Ghosted. And we reconnected, and he remembered me talking to me on the, you know, Parks and Rec shoot. And I uh, had a lot of fun on Ghosted shoot as well. <laughs> That's when I found out you can't cuss on network television. Uh, I accidentally said fuck on camera. So, <laughs> you know, you learn. You live, you learn. <laughs> um, But right now, I'm currently... Just auditioning and continuing to work. I'm doing some writing, uh, writing a couple pilots right now. Uh, I will be doing a roundtable this summer, a uh, couple roundtables actually this summer with local and national headlining comedians uh, for the Columbus Comedy Festival taking place this August in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, besides that, I'm just going to keep working, you know, it's, it's something I love to do and I'm incredibly blessed and fortunate to be able to live my dream. Yay. That's so exciting. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Irvin, for sending those in. He also sent me what, uh, where you can find him on social media. He gave me his Facebook. If you guys want to follow him on Facebook, he said he was totally fine with that. And, um, but he did say if you message him and you're a scammer, then he'll just like make fun of you and mess around with you. So, <laughs> but thank you so much for sending that. That is so amazing. I really wanted to know about that hot tub and it's so nice. Like if it was real and it's so nice to hear that, uh, Amy Poehler and Adam Scott and Nick Offerman and the whole crew were great. So very happy about that. Um, back to the show, though. He says he can't take it on the highway, which makes sense. So it'll take a few extra hours. Um, um, yeah. So, Jerry, it's now 4 a.m. Donna has to slam her desk to get him to stop. And then he did the wrong campaign letter. Oh, my God. I, Jerry, I was I was totally Donna in this moment. I was like, oh, my God. But he's, like, happy to redo it. He's, like, into it. And I'm just like, cannot. No. You just wasted, like, so much money, too. Like, you'll probably have to tear those envelopes open. You know what I mean? And they're all for not. Maybe not. Maybe he can do it. Oh, God. I don't know. Anyways, um, now we're back at Buddy Wood's house. Well, we're at Buddy Wood's house. We've just arrived. She's begging him not to air the tape. Um, clearly, that is an L.A. type of complex slash house. It, very, it looks very L.A. Turns out the airport in Pawnee lost Buddy Wood's luggage and the crew's luggage. The tape is gone. Thank God for the Minton factory tragedy. Am I right? <laughs> um, also, I was wondering, how long, how far away do we think that Pawnee is a, from Indianapolis? Like, they had to drive all night long, but it took a couple extra hours because they couldn't take it on highways. So I was going to say, like, maybe four to six hours, um, something like that, maybe eight, and then two hours by flight. Sounds right. I'm just curious, like, why Buddy flew and not drove, you know what I'm saying? But I guess if he has appointments to make, like, flying might be faster so i was just curious um anyway so they learn that information and they're like time to go bye um ben finally loosens up because he gets this good news and he opens the champagne which is so lovely fun ben lives definitely a cause for celebrating all right we're nearing the end of the episode ron comes in with his red sex shirt his tiger woods sex shirt um, if you're new here, it is based off Tiger Woods. <laughs> um, donuts, go nuts, gives him $25 to go buy a Walkman. <laughs> uh, Chris comes by though and says, thanks for a great evening. And that he's going to pursue Linda when she's ready. Yikes. He's going to try again, basically. And this is the arc where you start to feel bad for Chris because we started getting it last episode um, with him having like no family champions, like the only one that he's like kind of connecting with. And, um, Loving on him kind of thing. But this is just pitiful. I mean, yikes. You know, I'm not the biggest, like, I was not a huge fan of Chris. He was really annoying to me at the beginning. Um, I'm sorry. That's how I feel. Okay. 
whatever. But he compliments um, Ron's sex shirt and he like says he's going to try again. And like you really start to feel bad for him and like he's a human being. You know what I mean? Like he is a guy that we should probably like everybody deserves this, you know, um, deserves like a chance. And what a blow, though. He's complimenting the sex shirt with and he doesn't even know the backstory of it all. Oh, God. And he's like, you have to tell him. And I love this line. Andy's um, <laughs> line of like, you know, someone once told me that you have to face your fears head on. Oh, my God, Ron, it was you who told me that. <laughs> that is so brilliantly written. I love it so much. Um, it's so good. And uh, I also love that April is giving morals to Ron. Like, April is, uh, you know, what is what is that saying? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> um, yeah, it's just how the, how the turntables. You know what I'm saying? Um... The student becomes the master. That's the saying that I was about to get at. Think, Holly. Okay. Uh, Also, Andy looks like you could see makeup on him with, like, his clean-shaven beard. I don't know if that's real or not. It just looked very, like, airbrushed. Ron tells Chris what happened with Linda. Uh, Chris takes it very maturely, you know? So awkward, also. I mean, I don't know if you can imagine having this with your boss slash coworker, um this conversation now I will say um we already talked about this but you know I do think it was the right thing for for him to do I do think it was um and if you missed that go back and listen um okay so Chris oh gosh Chris hugs Ron so awkward I'm quite lonely (laughs) oh dear I love Ron's bleep they don't use the bleep very often you know and this one was good loved it um, Leslie has this beautiful talking head. Oh my God, it's so good. Where we reveal she's super lucky. She has all her friends and super lucky that the tape disappeared. But we learned that the airport workers threw the bag slash the tape that was in the bag away because she has done so much for them. I'm so floored by this and stunned by how deep I get with this show because it was, it was not all luck to me. You know what I mean? Um, she really fought for them and she's really just putting herself ahead of everybody else in a way. Um, and really just works so hard for people. And then, and to see that returned, even if it's in a TV show, even if it's in a false reality, it's so wonderful to see. I just love it so much. Um, she really fights for these people. And when you fight for someone, the hope is that like they'll you know, you'll reciprocate, you know what I'm saying? So it's really lovely. Um, but I do believe that luck exists. Like that's true. Um, there's a balance, but, um, yeah, it's just amazing to see. Then we have this classic talking head of Leslie talking about having sex with Ben. (laughs) He's about to get lucky. He doesn't even know it yet. (laughs) Ben's oblivious. He just turns around. He's like, what? (laughs) So good. Um, the tag is almost not even worth mentioning. I said it. Okay, Uh, Tom gives Anne condoms in this beautifully wrapped box as a present to celebrate the hours that they like their their record being shattered of the hours that they've been together. And she's like, "Okay, bye. We're not dating anymore. We're good. We're done. Bye. And this better be the last time. I better not come here next time talking about how I don't want you to be together anymore. And and. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Well, that was Lucky uh, from Parks and Rec uh, season. What was it? Season four, episode 18. Oh, my God. We're almost getting to the debate. We're almost getting to the debate, which is one of my all time favorite episodes ever. So, um, yeah, thank you for joining if you joined. Um, and I will hopefully be doing more of these, whether they're here, TikTok, wherever. If you have not rated and reviewed, please rate and review and do those things. Um, also, just a friendly reminder, I have bonus pods. I call them the bonus pod, um, a la strike pod, if you were here for that. Um, I am basically just doing this, but not only talking about parks I'm talking about other stuff too so if you want to do that it's three dollars a month the link is in the podcast uh subscription and it's also on the Instagram link in bio kind of thing too so you can do that um there will be merch soon park pals podcast this was a sample I am waiting on some some more samples to make sure that it's perfect for you we've got mugs we've got stickers we've got magnets they're all coming out and for maddie's baby um we're doing a baby um outfit so if you have a baby or a baby in your life a little park pal in training i made one for them 
Uh, and it literally says Park Pal in training. <laughs> so, um, yeah, take a look and have fun with that. And thank you so much for tuning in if you did. And I'll see you on the next one. Let me know if there's anything you want to talk about later. And I'll see you soon. Okay. I don't know how to exit out of this. So I'm just going to try. It might be awkward. Okay, bye. There's a park and some pals and there's also therapy too.